Hello, Internet. Welcome back. Uh, this is uh, the episode which I've been waiting for. We've got Commandant or Lieutenant Colonel Stefano here in front of me, 3 2 Battalion Ricky Wind, and then also uh, CSI. Quite a few other things as well, I presume. Uh, you will see my background is a bit different. It's because I got chased out of the studio. Uh, as you know, we're renovating the hotel here. And sadly for me, by building the guest toilets for the restaurant right below the studio. And man, that was a noise. That was such a noise that I said to myself, oh, I'll walk to the other side of the building. And the furthest way I could go horizontally is right where I'm now in the gym. I could have gone up four stories that side, but I had to carry the, the laptop and everything, and uh, rather not. Then you might also notice, if you look very faintly, there's still some cut here in my head. That was yesterday. I walked into the extractor fans, I suppose, you know, where you do the grills in the in a commercial kitchen, they have like these extractor fans. But the damn things were built for uh, short people, uh, for uh, more like the tie size. And so when I thought I would could bend myself into it anyway, I got a cut on my head. I hope it doesn't bother anyone. It's not serious, by the way. But yesterday I had to report with the sticky tape on it. I'm sure that a lot of people will laugh about it. Anyway, guys, by the time you watch it, it's a month later. So don't worry about it. Steph, you're so welcome, man. I'm, I'm really grateful to speak to you. I'm glad you want to speak about Colonel Jan Breitendorf. Uh, it's no use for you people to ask me to, to record the man. I think he's a bit advanced in age, uh, so I don't really want to do it. If he, of course, volunteers and he, and he comes over well, of course we will do it. It's the same with Echo Victor, who you also know well. Uh, Eric Fogun, the man, is a little bit on the, on the older side now. You people must remember, this is a generation before us. Uh, it's, it's actually seldom that you find a, a uh, quite a healthy looking youthful type of major general these days. I think Les Rockman is one of them, but yeah, we will speak to General Rockman at some stage. And uh, even the Brigadier, the Brigadier Generals are now getting a bit long in the tooth. Point I'm making is, guys, come, come and speak to Legacy. Don't waste time. Don't, don't, I almost said F around. Don't, don't play the fool here with me. Because once you're gone, you're gone. There's nothing I can do then. So, I've made my long introduction, step. now I keep quiet, man. Can you tell me what about Colonel Jan? What, what is it about that, man? Good day, uh, Chris, all the viewers. And thank you for the opportunity again for, to speak about probably the most famous, the most notorious and, uh, well, just, uh, he's a, uh, He's one of our best soldiers, out and out. Of course, now, Colonel Jan Dirk Breitenbach, he was born in 1932, and he grew up in the Southern Cape, in the town Robertson, in that area. Now, he also had a couple of famous brothers, like the, uh, the poet Breiten Breitenbach, and also... Kluter, Kluter Breitmach was a famous um, uh, photographer. And then he also had a, another brother, sort of an outsider. And his name was Basjan. Now, Basjan, um, I think he was a teacher or lecturer from Peter Maritzburg. And he came to visit us a, a few times up here in the Caprivi. And yes, it was great to meet him. Um, now, Colonel Breitmach, uh, before he enlisted with the South African Army, or I think those years it was the Union Forces, it was still under the British control. But in that time, he was uh, like a navigator on the for the British Navy, obviously on the you know those warships. And he was involved in the fight in the Suez crisis. I think it was the early early 60s and also the Biafran War. But the Biafran War is actually the first operation of 
the Rekis, or as they called them at those times, uh, the Dirty Dozen. And that is the founder members of the Rekis. So subsequently, also he was with the Namibian War, the Border War, involved with all that. And uh, I don't need to mention, but he is the founder, founding commander of the Rekis of 3-2 Battalion, 44 Parachute Brigade. And then he also founded the Kurella School, which is the ST School from uh, Special Task School for CSI, Chief of Staff Intelligence. Um, it, you know, he is so famous, there's not a lot I can add, but he, he was a man full of character. And all the positive um, things, I, I cannot name them. There is too many. But I, I'm sure during my um, conversation here, many of those characters will come out. Uh, the first thing, if you, if you meet Colonel Breitenbach, is those steel gray eyes. And he will just look through you. It's like x-rays and he scans you and you just stand there and you, you, you almost, it's scary. So anyhow, and if you know him later on and he looks at you the first, then you know he's in a good mood or he's in a bad mood. So you, you always judge by his eyes. Um, but anyhow, I think the first time I met him, was at Amahoni with the Reiki wing. He came there around about 1979 and he tried to recruit our officers and NCOs um, for his Pathfinder group. Okay, the Pathfinders was basically your uh, parabat Reiki groups, but he amalgamated them uh, when he started with uh, the 44 Parachute Brigade. So anyhow, he would come there and say, listen, guys, I need some officers and NCOs. And we said, sorry, sir, we've got the Reiki group. We stick, uh, we, we can't just abandon our troops. So he left and... Uh, in 1983, when I signed up uh, on with CSI, I met him. We were then in the Zamza building there in Victoria, Bruce Street. And that's the time when he prepared to start the, the gorilla school year. So, uh, we, my base initially was here at Sukuma. So we had to move over into Angola. Oh, just to orientate this quickly here. Yeah. The north is there, and right on the eastern side is Zambia. Then we have the Kwanda River here, going south, then it moves east towards the Lenyati swamps. And obviously in the south is Botswana. Here we have the Caprivi Strip, which was a, a military area. And I'll come back to that later. And then obviously in the north Angola, we, we had most of the UNITA camps there. So Colonel um, Breitenbach started off in late 83 uh, because I came back from that first uh, operation where we infiltrated about 800 kilometers and then he was already at, at the old Tsufuma. Um So in that period um, I think I just came back from that operation Garton and 
uh, I was at that T grade base at where there's a, a airstrip, the Guabata airstrip. And my commander, Don Delaray, he said, there's a, um, some VIPs coming. In, in fact, that was the whole of the cabinet. From PV Buerta, he just got uh, state pre pre uh, president. Uh, Magnus Malong, Pat Buerta, Flock, all those guys were there. I think they were 10 or 11. And uh, they came, they flew in with a chopper, around about there. And um, then Savimi was supposed to come down south to the bases there. And uh, he said, no, he's not coming down. Uh, the cabinet will meet him in, on his terrain. So just to show him, look, if you come to visit me, don't come and visit me in Namibia. You come and visit me in my country. So Don de la Rey said, oh God. Now Don didn't have arms. Remember, he was blown off. So Don said to me, Steph, you're the most senior guy here. Grab a pistol, grab the Gary, the 10 seater Land Rover, the old ones. And I parked there by the chopper and they got in. And uh, I remember Magnus was right next to me, went there, there. In the back was uh, Puck, um, Flock, and the Minister of Justice. I think it was Quibi with C or something. You should know. And then in the back was Fricky, Fricky de Clerc, the man we love so much, you know. So anyhow, he was the most junior um, cabinet minister, minister and as we drove off and I went into Angola it was a sandy road I, I think it was um, yeah it was Pervia he said to Magnus Magnus that poor major you must get him a, a medal and he uh, said Magnus said, yes, but you know, sir, and, and the next moment, but also he agreed. He says, ah, no, Magnus, you must give it. And then right behind me, Kobe Kutsia said, no, 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 you guys. What about Jan Breitenbach? No, we don't talk about him. His politics is not right and this and that. And I thought, you know, if <laughs> I, I was... I thought, okay, I've got the star pistol. There's nine bullets. I'll save one guy. I'll I'll leave Kobe because he spoke the most sense. So anyhow, after this meeting came back, and I, then I passed to my camps where we were building. We built the road here. So I met the colonel at Saint Michel, and I told, but. <laughs> I, I was scared if I did execute them. I mean, I would have been the, the worst character and the Reikis will be hunting for me. So I told the colonel and I saw him again some months later. And he said to me, why didn't you do it? <laughs> and anyhow, so uh, then after, uh, as, as you know, in 1985, the colonel came to my base in Angola, Ilya, and he just said, pack your bags, you're coming. So I started working for him, and my first um, base was at Fort Kasinga, and uh, it was right over there. So we came down, and nearby the border, he turned to the east to, towards Zambia. And then it came down here. And it, 
if you can see, there's a small little island. And he took his clothes off and he said to me, take off your clothes. And the next moment, we did the river crossing. So we went across in that island. And uh, he said to me, you see here, you're going to build me a base for 20 uh, instructors. And across, you will have a, a place for 200 uh, soldiers. And you've got six weeks. And I thought, oh, that, that's a bit, you know, that, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's no material. The way we built in Angola, you go into the bush and you cut, tall trees and straight ones and all that. So anyhow, uh, he took me to Saint Michel, yeah, and introduced me to everyone. This was like the HQ and also the the family base. Because on this side, uh, there would be the houses where the married couples stay, and across the, the road was the colonel's office, the vehicle park, and later on, Willem Rata and Peter, Peter Williams stayed there. So, he gave me a Unimog, an old one, but I was really happy because I haven't had a vehicle for three, four years. So, And uh, it was on a Friday, I think, and the weekend, we just... Um, we, uh, I met with all the people, the whole team. Went on the river with the boats. So my Monday, I, uh, I got to his office. I saluted him. I said, Colonel, I just want to know my workforce, my laborers for, for the building the base. He looked at me and said, that is your problem. <laughs> I just turned around and I went straight back to Angola and I got my sergeant, Dave Roosley, and a team of builders. They were about 10, 12, and also my cook, Danny. So we came, we pitched up tents here, about three tents, and we started building the base. So later on, when it went well, uh, I moved to Kasinga and I was the base commander there. Um, then we also had a group from UNITA who had to do a, a target study. One of my old uh, groups that came to do a target study here. Uh, now it's basically the final preparation for a specific operation that they were going to do. I think it was more like infrastructure, you know, and uh, or dam. Uh, I can't remember, but the, from the Reikis came two guys. Um, they were quite a lot, but I know specifically Johnny de Guar, the, the Govea, and there was a Mac guy. I'm not sure if it was Mac van Amara, but anyhow. So we, if you look at this guy here between the colonel and his wife, the back, his name is Marius Heyman. Now, he was, he studied nature conservation, but also um, forestry. And he was the uh, forestry manager. He was a sawmill at Ketima Mulilu. So he was in charge of that. But later on, the colonel recruited him. He was a staff sergeant in the artillery. So that's why you see Marius there. And uh, he, he came to us and he said, you know, guys, this weekend, um, in Katima, there's um, a bar 
belongs to the, the Air Force. It was called SAF City. It's got a, um, a robot with the red, green, or red, orange, green. And that meant if it's red, the bar is closed. If it's uh, orange, it's going to close soon. And then the green, it's open. So we had an invitation by the teachers. There was about three female teachers. And they said, why don't you guys come along? But the bar, you have the bar, and if you walk straight through the bar, there's like an entertainment area. It's the lava and the swimming pool, etc. And that's where they were having a private party. So we picked up um, Marius and we went through with my uni mob. So there's four of us. And as we entered the bar, it was just mayhem. Because Johnny was the last guy and I walked after Marius. And the next moment they started punching and they were punching everyone. And I turned around, helped Johnny. He was already thrown out of the door. A lot of things broken. And, uh, anyhow, then somebody tapped me. And I, as I turned around, I hit the, the commander of the, the, the Air Force. He's, he's, uh, he was a Major Brown. Oh, anyhow, on that Monday, Tuesday, the colonel called us. He actually came to us and he said, Yalla, yalla, yalla. You guys, you are bad. You you know, my, my, um, I don't have a good record here in, at sector 70, the, the, and, uh, now you come and you, you, mess it up again. Go to Katima, see the commanders, go on orders and sort out your things and repair everything. I said, okay. So we had to walk. Uh, he refused to give us transport. Now, if you can see from here, from the uh, Congola Bridge, it's 120 kilometers. So anyhow, halfway or something, we, we got it, um, a small Nissan station wagon. You can remember it was a blue color. And he stopped. But, you know, those old Kawangus, they, they will drive 30 kilometers an hour. Even if the car can do 100 plus. They just... So <laughs> after about two hours, we got there. And we saw the commander, he was very, very upset, angry, and the major was there. And then they banned me from Katima Mulelu and from Mapacha for two years. And they said, you're not going to fly. You will not enter this place. So then back, and the colonel's house was here. You can see Buffalo Lodge. Right as you come in, you can see. And then we came in and we walked and round about here, halfway to St. Michel. He came past with his land cruiser and he stopped. Now we just external and you see that you sort your stuff out. I said, yes, Colonel. He said, okay, I'll see you in the bar. <laughs> so we went to the bar and he said, yeah, no, this and that and all. He said, yeah, please don't, don't go there anymore. And you, Rick, is also. Just go fly and no more, no more safe cities. Anyhow, about a month, two months later now, every Every Saturday, I, the colonel came and he would have inspection at my base. And only at my base. I think he, 
he kept me busy so so that on weekends I don't start doing naughty things too early. So anyhow, and uh, after a month or two, he, uh, on on Fridays we always had a snack evening here in the bar. And I think there's a photo somewhere I'll send it. I'll put it up. And um, my cook, Danny, we would have a snack at the bar. You know, he made all these snacks and mini pizzas and all the nice things. So uh, he came to me and he said, Steve, tomorrow you report. Yeah, it's in Michelle. Now, you don't ask questions because the, normally it, uh, he reports to there and I have his inspection. And this time I came and he invited me for inspection there. And as I arrived, I see the same major, Major Brown, and I wonder, oh, what is the Another problem again, and I thought, oh. So we started, we walked around the base, and they, they walk right next to the colonel. And uh, after a few minutes, he stopped, and he said, do you know Steve? He asked the major. Uh, the major said, yes, yes. So. He said, do you know why I got stick? No, sir. He says, so that he can stuff up majors like you. <laughs> and <laughs> I thought, yeah, now, you know, and after the inspection, the major came to me. He says, Steph, you are well, welcome anytime in Katia. Or Mapacha, you can come, you can fly from our bases. <laughs> so the colonel, you know, he, he took his punches, but he gave a few back as well. But uh, it was quite funny. Um, at one stage, while I was busy building the Hippo base, um, my team's because we didn't want to destroy the forest here. Uh, over here, there was, um, by the Lignati swamps, there were some good Mopani trees, and they, they, they are quite straight and tall, and they've got a lot of forks like this, you know, where you can use for good construction. So anyhow, <laughs> I... I took the Samo, it was over 100 kilometers. And uh, before I left, I went to the signaler. And I said to her, listen, uh, I need a radio charge and give me all the, the, the frequencies and the schedules. She gave it to me. And uh, I, it was a captain also. Potty, 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 potty. And in the past, we also cut some trees here. There was also Mopani um, uh, bushes here. But you know, Mopani, they, they grow in these marshy black turf soil. Um, and you, you easily get stuck. So we got here. And the teams were cutting and, uh, you know, all with axes, but they could at least cut 10 trees or 20 a day. And then they will hire a team of loaders, three or four. And then they drop it in uh, bundles and then I'll come pick up and move with the truck. And I, you know, I normally have a unique guy just because I said to them, these marshes or puddles, you must go around them. You don't want to get stuck there where it's soft. And uh, 
the next moment the, the soul will just went right on the axles, on the chassis. We were digging, digging, and I, I thought, oh, let me quickly get on the radio. Because it was um, getting late afternoon. And as I tuned in, they said, okay, let's go over to the new frequency. So they changed frequencies. And I didn't have the, the new frequency. So we stayed there for three nights, four nights in, in the bush here. And trying to get out, but no, no avail. And uh, anyhow, I I said to Danny, my cook, I said, Danny, you're the only one who speak a bit English, and you know this area. So I want you to move back and go to the colonel. Don't go to anyone and inform him. Got there, and uh, 40, 40 told him I was cutting poles here in this direction, completely opposite. And he said, but why would Steph go there? He says, no, the poplar's there is much better. Now, poplar, you know what this is, the poplar, the popular, the plant, also a small tree, but it doesn't even exist there. They, it's not the area because it's exotic species. And uh, the colonel said to him, but there is no poplars in, in this whole Capri. What is this poplars? He said, no, no, Steph said the poplars. And they got to me, the colonel, first thing he said is, yo, Blitzen, why didn't you have a, a radio? I said, sir, there's the radio. But they didn't give me the new frequency. Carry on. And what is it? What is this poplars? I said, I never said uh, I'm going to cut poplars. Anyhow, they got me out with about four unimogs, and we got in the base that evening. And the colonel called Potty, and he said, "But no, from now on, your name is Potty Poplar." <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it was quite funny. On, on, the, on the snack evenings, it was so social. The, the women, the children, everyone. And then you will discuss the week's happenings, you know. Yeah, you did that again. And, uh, and it, it was like a debrief between uh, all of us. And uh, then... At one stage, the colonel came to Cassina and he had four lion cubs. Apparently, the lion cubs came from, um, from Buffalo. They found it in the training base. And the colonel brought them there. I had to put them in my room, in my house. And I had this ultramel, and he said to me, give them ultramel, one liter and one egg. And he's off, he went to, to Katima Molele to buy some titi bottles. I think he came with about 10 of those titi bottles. And we were feeding those lions. I must tell you that they were so... Their tummies were so full. They couldn't walk. They just, oh, they lie there and there. <laughs> so when they got bigger, uh, we had to make an enclosure for them. And later on, they, they grew quite quickly. And uh, later the colonel said to me, Steve, you have to build me a boma. And he went to show me. So we build a boma around there. Um, and I think it was in the... Now, my base was not even a company strength at Fort Kassinger. Um And the one, I think it was a Tuesday when we had our resupply of rations and that. 
I see, but these double the rations. These are another company's rations. And I thought, no, no, no. Sometimes they do make mistakes. And uh, I went to the colonel and he came to me. He says, you keep quiet. You are now, you've got two companies. He said, yeah, but what are we going to do with all this meat? He says, man, that's for the lions. <laughs> So we every day he would come up and then we move with the meat and then he feeds them there and plays with them and yeah, it was quite a sight, but they, they got quite big. Then uh yeah, something very unfortunate happened. The two two were bitten by a mamba, black mamba, in in this bomber. And we couldn't find this mamba. And they were bitten like one day apart. So we tried to pull out the, the other two. They, their names were Rufus and Diane. So we let them roam a bit here. Yeah. And every day we just come and visit and give them their meat out in the open. Um, yeah, uh, then after this, Mrs. B also, oh, what I want to mention is the Colonel then started to study nature conservation at the SA Technicon, and he was a conservationist from the beginning, from the old Doppies days, and um, uh, nobody was allowed to shoot anything. Um, so, in that time, he used it as, you know, it was, he would do a lot of um, study work here in the area, especially weekend. And then we started with some anti-poaching patrols. But later it intensified. Um, first, we would just cover this area. And then later, um, Doppy sort of closed down. It, it wasn't the official training base um, anymore since, I think, late 86, 87. But I'll come back to that later. And uh, we uh, we did our own patrols here over weekend. And then in, um, in 1986, oh, yes, in, in 1986, the, um, he went to Rundu and see the nature conservation there. Now, every week, you would also visit the conservationists there. They, con conservationists was, were not allowed to come into uh, this military area. They came under escort. But, um, so, Colonel Young took over many of their tasks. And then he started from about 86, 85. He would um, uh, do, speak to the SAF guys and the, the ALO pilots. And then he would, you know, the, the pilots, they also adventurous. So they want to fly and do, you know, nice scenery things. And he, he liaised with conservation and uh, the Air Force. So every year they would come and visit Saint Michel. We would have fuel there on the, 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 the chopper zone or the pad. And then every morning with one uh, conservationist and the pilot and the colonel, etc. They would do a count 
from 10 kilometers round about here and then this whole area and the average over those years uh, they would uh, count the elephants and see for rhino and all the ray games and there was 10,000 elephants every year on average so it was quite a big amount uh, I mean my my camp especially this area they would just run the whole time and um, some of those elephants became very friendly to us I, th I think I've showed you a picture of uh, Stompy the guy uh, he, went, he adopted us in, in our base, he would not leave that base. And uh, you can pat him, and he was quite a funny character. So, uh, at one stage, Savimbi had a, a parade at his UNITA base. So, he landed this airstrip here is called Immelman, the wreck is everyone used to. It. Later on, we uh, we used it, I think, more intense. So we picked up, the colonel just said to me, uh, Steph, come, get your, get your uh, Unimog, let's go. Arrived here, and there's a bimby with all these generals. I think there was about six generals. And about 15 bodyguards. Um, so the colonel had a that, that new defender Land Rovers, the petrol V8 one, and he. Uh, I must first come back to the nature conservation in Rundu. They had one of the game wardens there had a, a leopard, and it was already fully grown and it was in the town of Rundu and this cat was by then 75 plus kg so he was big and potent so the colonel came with Tanu and here by his office we bought an enclosure and it was with these um, high then a tree, uh, you know, the with the razor wire, and the cat would just jump over there and uh, would lie in the trees. And anyhow, in in the evenings, he's out because that's when he hunts. And if you are outside, you know you're in for a surprise because. He, he does these mock attacks and grab you and play with you. So Altanu kept us uh, on our toes quite often, especially if if, uh, if you want to go out to the urinals. You know those urinals with those pipes. And you just look like, where's the cat? Where's the cat? <laughs> so anyhow... Tanu was later on sort of transferred to the Boma there. And uh, we were always around in this area. So we came with that Savimbi and his delegation. And when he came till about here, the colonel stopped. And I wonder, what is he doing now? And he went out the colonel and he just looked and he made as if he was having a you know um a wee in the in the grass so the next moment Tanu comes he jumps into the land rover <laughs> there's Savimbi all the generals <laughs> They're flying out of the windows and doors and the, my bodyguards here in the back, they just, hey, hey, hey. 
<laughs> but so when we ran to the to uh, the trees there in the open, and they they started climbing, and the colonel just said, "He stood there, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> He laughed at them all. <laughs> but the colonel had such a he he could laugh out of his stomach, you know. He, and sometimes he he would laugh for his own jokes and ah, ah, ah. <laughs> but anyhow, I had to walk, uh, drive with the Unimog to all the trees where the general sat, and then they would climb down. <laughs> they were too scared. <laughs> so uh, yes, there was a quite a few funny incidents with Tanu. Uh, I can't name them all, but um, then in 19, in 1986, March, the colonel came to me and he said, listen, get your best uniform out. Uh, we're going to Buffalo. And it was the 10th anniversary of the to Battalion. By then, um, Colonel Eric Fulhoun was, um, and he was a colonel already. Uh, we got there, and Colonel Eddie took Colonel Young to his new, newly acquired, mechanized um, um, force, as I told you before in the previous episode. We we had two, three two had two groups: a mechanized group or battalion, and then the normal uh, semi or counter insurgent group. So over there, uh, I, I was driving the colonel. He said to me, "You're driving. I just want to relax." So got there and. Uh, yeah, the, one of, I don't know who the edge was at that stage, but um, he gave me a big, quite an attitude. And uh, I was in the bar and he came and he said, who the hell are you? And blah, blah, blah. But I'm talking to all the guys like Pete Boer, Pete Hansel, and Pete said to him, hey, Captain, you better salute this man. <laughs> he's, he's not, you know, he's one of the first. And he's, oh, he says, and he came with the colonel. What? Really? So, anyhow, we left it there. And uh, I think that's the last parade I attended with the colonel. Um, but it's... We then um, did the training on that, um, can I say, the, the body uh, personal protection team. After that, or during that stage, the Colonel and Les Ratman formed two liaison teams and they went in to the south of Quito Canaval. And that was the start of the Ops Modular. I think it was called Ops Alpha Centauri, as, as the medic yesterday. So they obviously had their findings and um, they recommended that uh, you, we must send in more mechanized uh, battalions. And that is now. Uh, Operation Modular, Hooper, and Tactor got off. So when the Colonel came back, I I think I was on a um, intelligence course and came back and the guy said to me, oh, oh, there's something big. And we were preparing to go to... Um, to put it in a wall and blow that bridge up. Now, 
<laughs> that's a job for Rekis. That's not. And uh, the colonel said, yeah, no problem. Because he was there already. Uh, I think Les will tell us he was, they were right at the bridge. He even walked on the air, air strip. And uh, anyhow, we were going to train in, in the clappers, those fold-up uh, kayaks. And in the team, it was the colonel and Marius, the forestry guy, uh, Marius Heyman. They were in one clipper, and Jake's Jacobs and myself. And then the other one, there was Pete Brink and uh, Saro Base. He was from 14 Artillery School. Um, so we we trained in I think two three times a day for two three hours with the clipper stream up stream up. I tell you the colonel without rowers all I couldn't believe that <laughs> he's he's twenty five years he was already in his fifties and he outpaced us all so yeah he was a great great man and even. We had uh, siestas, so that means you you work from early seven, and then I think nine ten we have a, a brunch, and then twelve o'clock when the intense heat start, then it's from twelve till two it's siesta time, and the colonel would just take off his brown shirt, and then he runs to his lodge. From, it's about three kilometers. And he runs there, takes a nap, and then he runs back in the heat of the day. <laughs> so, we are uh, also with the colonel's wife. Um, she was our clinic sister, Mrs. B. She was a full uh, qualified um, uh, sister. And she had the rank of a lieutenant with us. And uh, she, I think she still rides a Suzuki SJ14 uh, GP. So that was her car. And it, she bought it herself. So she would come to Kasinga. It's, I had the only clinic on in the whole semi-shell. So then we would work together and uh, she would tell me, you know, Steph, help me here, do this and that. Did a lot of maintenance. And uh, when the colonel come for inspection, then she would stand by me. She, and I said, attention. And then we salute the colonel. She salutes her husband. <laughs> And then we start with the inspection. Normally, it's a clinic first. So that one day, things didn't went so well. But uh, anyhow, they, I'll see if there's a picture. But right next to the clinic, there was a, a sausage tree. You know, these big sausages, I think that the scientific name is Kigelia, that tree. Um, and those things are heavy, about two, three, four kil uh, kilograms. And this, this tree caused a lot of damage to the, the roof and the structure. So later on, she used that just as a storage area. And uh, I think there was three rooms it was first the uh, accommodation, but then I built uh, some other houses on the on the river. So we then moved and built a, a ward with uh, ablution blocks. And this day the colonel came and he saw there's a lot of grass and dirt on on the and he said, sister, how can you? And he 
he's really angry and uh, she says, but Colonel, it's these mortars. They keep coming through the roof and I cannot stop them. And he says, sister, what mortars? Who's attacking you? I didn't hear any mortars here. <laughs> and Zambia is too far away for them to, to shoot with mortars. <laughs> and she walked outside. She said, those mortars there in the tree. <laughs> so it was the sausage. So anyhow, we went uh, after inspection. The colonel always came to my house and then he will have some tea, him and Mrs. B. So got there and I, I uh, boiled us some water for the tea. And while I'm busy there in the kitchen, the colonel, I had a, a recreation area there. And you know these scopes, the, the pin-ups from the scope. Now, it's not pure nudes. They were covered with, with stars and stickers and whatever. And normally they just had nice swim, swimsuits on. So I had these pinned up because I know somebody else will steal it. If it's there, then everyone can look. So the colonel came and he was looking there. The next moment, Mrs. B enters my house, but she slammed the feet and says, Dum, dum. Say, Jan Dirk, you shouldn't be looking at that. <laughs> she left, and the colonel, he, he just said, uh oh, now I'm out of luck. <laughs> so, anyhow, we had tea and he left, but yeah, it was quite funny. <laughs> um, I, there was also other incidents. Um, I think on his birthday, um, I was a duty officer. Now, normally, if, um, we, we were only three officers. So what we did, if it's your duty, you are for the whole week on duty. And then I had to sleep at St. Michelle. They had some officers' quarters here. Um, so I would sleep there the whole week because uh, it, it's 24. In the days I would go to my base and work there. And I, at that stage, the colonel got me um, one of those Honda XR500. So because I had to travel quite a lot, uh, I used the bike when I was on duty. So anyhow, that night, it was on the colonel's birthday, and um, he came to me and he said, we will close the bar 11, 11 o'clock, and that's it. Um, I think Jake's was just about to leave, and then we closed the bar, and now the medic who was the barman has to go around to the, the generator sat here by the edge of, of close by the river. So it's quite it's more than half a kilometer's drive. And I was just sitting on my bed the next moment I heard <coughs> and I knew that's an accident. And when I got there, Jake's had this medic and he was dusting him off a bit. How can you? And so Jakes was on his way to, to his house when this happened. So he went through the bushes and he grabbed this man. I got there. I said, oh, Major, leave the medic. And I said, come, come with me. And he was giving me an attitude as well. And then I, I also dust him a bit and about two days later the colonel came and very very angry so there was a big 
uh, Jakes and I were banned from the bar, and uh, I I went back to to Kasinga, and by my house in the lounge area, the, the water was right about four or five meters from me, but it was on a bank. So the house was here and then the bank. So I decided I'm going to build a bar here. So I knocked this wall out and I started building. And about a week later, the colonel came in. And says, what are you doing here? I said, Colonel, I'm building a bar for myself. He says, Okay, you just leave my trees alone. So I had to buy all the material, and uh, he, he even came to me and said, Steve, when you're almost done, I've got a right bar counter for you. I'll go and show you. He said, Thank you, Colonel. <laughs> so he approved of the bar, and uh, he, he didn't. Uh, see it as a, a threat that now I'm taking over a bar, I'm banned. He forgot about that. He just said, yeah, yes, Steph has got, he, he's building a great bar. <laughs> so uh, we got that counter and we were almost finished, busy with the touch-ups. And then at the office, there was a minor tactics course. Um, the course leader was Dave Davis. He was a major then. And Dave came to me and he asked me, Steph, you know, can I uh, can I have my course function at your place? I said, Dave, you know, I'm not finished. And before you, you must ask the colonel, because he's the officer commanding you. So go through the channels, you know. And luckily, there was Saro Base sat right next to me. We were giving a staff course for Unita, and Saro heard what I told Dave. So I left it there, and the one day, Dave uh, said, okay, he wants uh, so much alcohol and that, and I sent Danny to the bar because the, all the big stocks were kept here at St. Michelle. And as I, as Danny drove back to Kasinga, he drove, the colonel drove past him. The colonel stopped him. He said, he asked, now, uh, what is that? And that it was full of beer and alcohol. And Bernie said, no, it's the, um, Steph is opening the bar at Kasinga. Oh, he sent Danny back to take that alcohol. There is no, and he turned straight back to me. And he said, yo, you, you will not have a function today. You have got that as well. I said, yes, Colonel, yes, Colonel. And he, he was very angry. So when he was done, Saro said, Colonel, excuse me, can I just say something? He says, yes. He said, well, it's not Steph's fault. You must speak to Dave Davis. This is what happened. And he says, oh, okay. You can have your party, but if you open the bar, I will be invited. Do you get me? <laughs> oh, the colonel. So, uh, there's so many. Oh, and one, I remember we had a, the colonel had a cook from all his years in Rhodesia. His name was Tomasi. He's a Zimbabwean. And Tomasi had also had a young young woman. And we Tomasi went, he would have a peri peri or a, a bush about this size. 
but always full of chilies. And it's these devil, devil chilies, Satana. So Wednesdays was um, a, a peri peri chicken evening, but not everyone ate um, peri peri like the kids. So the colonel always said, all right, make one, one lot normal and the other lot. So uh, another thing, good character of the colonel is he never dished up first. He was the last one to dish up. It would be the kids first, then the women, the ladies, then the troops, then the NCOs, and it will be him last. So this day, I don't know what happened. I think there was extra people, which Tomasi didn't calculate, but uh, there was no chicken, not even a peri-peri. And the colonel, he didn't even complain. He went to Tomasi and he said, next time, you make that peri-peri too hard so nobody can eat it. <laughs> and you make extra peri-peri <laughs> so that they won't take his peri-peri chicken. Uh, yes, um, of course, yes, we had a, a wonderful time. And, uh, there's so many things. And uh, the colonel is just always in the same mood. He will, to me, he was like a, a father. And when I'm when I'm almost done, I'll tell you why. And uh, yes, he, he guided me. He, I learned a lot from him, to be honest. And the fact that he, he let me go do my own thing. You are big enough now, sort out your things. It's your problem. And uh, you just wanted the results. So... Obviously, the colonel, uh, he wanted to retire as a game ranger. And, um, and no other better place than at Sir Michel. And that is why he built the Buffalo Lodge there. He built it with his own money, own uh, material. I think the only guys, they did a proper thatch roof. That was uh, done by the buffalo builders. And, um, yes, yeah, so the colonel was sort of uh, in that. He, he already prepared his retirement. And uh, he was going to retire there. And then, obviously, liaise with the game wardens. That he was already a... a Honorary game warden. So by the end, before he retired, um, he sort of he came to me. There, there were some problems. Um, things didn't uh, work out well. I think I've mentioned that uh, Bert Sucks was trying to hire and fire everyone and uh, yes, he came. Uh, I, I already left then for a brief period. But when I came back, he said to me, come, let's, let's go for a drive. Colonel Breitenbach. So we went back the same place when he, I started to work for him. At that same point, And he said to me, can you reply? I said, yes, when, you, when I brought you here, there was not a bridge there. There was no buildings on the other side. There was nothing here. I said, yes, when, said, okay, come, let's walk across. So we walk across. And he started speaking to me about um, 
is Colonel Bert Socks. And he said to me, Steph, that guy doesn't like you and he's going to get rid of you. So he just said to me, only you can take care of yourself and you only trust yourself. So that's my advice. I can do nothing for you now. I said, thank you, Colonel. And we went back and I think that stayed with me forever. But And if, if I look back, I did exactly what he said because I knew when things were not going to go my way, I had to take care of it. So, um, yeah. Uh, I also, in, in 1988, before I left, he wrote a letter to General Feldmeis and uh, he handed it to me. And he said to me personally, you know, he handed to General in person, which I did. Then uh, came back and I think there was too much politics from CSI side. They didn't like the colonel because I think they were they were thinking that the colonel would interfere in, in our business in the operations, but that's which isn't the case. I mean, he he was already appointed as a game warden, and now he was told, "No, you're not allowed." It's the same thing. We we knew anyhow that with resolution four three five in end of 89, we would have pulled out of this whole area. Then it's not a military area anymore. Then it, it will become a conservation area again. So anyhow, there was big problems and the colonel just left for Sedgefield and yeah, he enjoyed his retirement there. I think he did uh, I'm not sure if it's Transkei or one of those neighboring states. He worked there for a while. And, uh, yeah, I, I met him quite often in Pretoria. His son, Richard, uh, stayed close to me, um, about two or three kilometers. And then one day I spent I stayed on a small holding on the Michalisburg mountain. <clears throat> and we, me and my wife, we would do spring cleaning the house. So there was a large veranda outside. So all the mattresses is out and spring clean. And the next moment, my daughters saw a man coming through the bush. And, uh, they shouted at me, Daddy, Daddy, look at this tramp coming through the bush here. And I said, what? And it's Colonel Breitenbach. And I went to greet him and said, yeah, Yalamuni, don't talk like that. It's it's my, it's an old wormy, an uncle of mine. And um, even my wife asked, who's this old toppy here? And the colonel said to her, she, hey, I, I quite like you. You should have worked for me because you've got the attitude. <laughs> yeah, that was good times. Um, we, in 1991, uh, we wanted to carry on with nature conservation. Yeah, in uh, this is the Kwanukubongo province, but it's it's a vast open savanna field. If you look at the map, it's just savanna. There is almost no town the, in that whole area of five hundred um, by five hundred kilometers. There's there's not one taro except the one that 
it's from Puerto Carnaval to Menong. The rest is just bush. So we wanted to, to it was called Cutadas. Cutada in Portuguese is a hunting concession. So that was what it was used. So we wanted to, to uh, bring the game back um, and make it protection area or conservation area. So he wrote a whole proposal, which I had a friend who became the first military attaché in, in uh, Rwanda, Angola. And I handed it to him and said, please, please, just see what you can do. Go to the Minister of Tourism, or I think it was tourism, and see if you can get us a concession there. Well, nothing happened for a few years. And then later on, I heard that he got the concession himself. So he took it for himself. And I think about five years ago, there was a, there's a guy, Stefan van Weyck. And if you go on internet or I know in Facebook is well known, his company is Uncharted Angola. So he does tours and, and the conservation in this whole area. So, and he's doing fantastic work. The game are returning, uh, numbers are um, picking up. And uh, yes, he's having tours, he's doing the conservation there. And he uses some of our old places here. So. Um, yeah, at least something, the good news is uh, the, all the wildlife, the game returned. And then also in 1993, after 3-2 was banned, I spoke to the colonel again and we thought that maybe we should um, get the old 3-2 battalion, those who lost their work or so that we can start an African peacekeeping force, which will be stationed in a neutral country in Africa, like, like uh, Malawi or, you know, central country. So we did that and the core would have been uh, like you need a, uh, to battalion proposal for this African peacekeeping force didn't materialize, um, even though we tried on the highest level at the UN. And shortly after, the um, private military companies started to pop up. And, uh, yes, one of the most famous and successful was the executive outcomes of uh, Ivan Barlow. And a lot of 3-2 guys went to join there and they went all over the world. Some, some of them did uh, demining, mine clearance, etc. So, of course, yes, uh, that is basically the kernel and uh, there's so many other things we can talk about. Um, but there's many other people. I know Les Ratman would also like to, to talk about the colonel more on, on his professional level. Um, but yes, he's a very, very interesting man. Yeah, thank you, Steph. I really enjoyed that. You know, we hear all these uh, stories of a colonel. It's really great for us to meet somebody who actually knew the man, who worked with the man. I just want to play something on record here. Scope magazine. It did have very good articles in it. And if you believe me, then there's something wrong with you. We did not buy the Scope magazine for the articles. But I do want to say, the first time I heard about the Pathfinders in the Parabats, it's actually in the Scope magazine. I had some article on there. And it was a good article, actually, with all jokes aside. But now, of course, 
I need to ask you something. I've heard that Colonel Breitenbach was known as Carpenter. So that he used the call sign Carpenter. Is that true? And do you know the story perhaps behind it? Yes. What I heard, this started during Operation Savannah when the, the troops, the, they were then like FNLA, but um, they they moved up north to Luanda and fought there. And, you know, the FNLA was very disorganized. And and I think that's where they gave him the name Car Carpentero, which is Carpenter. And the thing, I think why they gave him that name was because he can fix anything <laughs> he would. <laughs> and... Also, that was our motto, you know, fought in the battle. So you fix the things there in the battle and he hammers you. <laughs> yeah, that, that brings me to another question. Do you think that Colonel Breitenbach was ever unconscious? Or was he one of the men, like your funny manner? Or did you know with him, look, there's a certain way you just don't speak to the man because he's going to move you or something? Was that... Part of his nature. No, no. Uh, he will. How can I say? Even if a troop don't stand on the tension for him, or uh, he would just. But don't. If he's in the wrong mood, it can be a general or a troopy. You're gonna get it. Then, then you must be very, very careful. <laughs> Yeah, man, like that with my enemies, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but I want to ask you a different question, two things quickly. Uh, this Jake's, Jacobs, Jacobs, or what you talk about, is that Glenn Jake's or Juan Ricky? No, no, no. It's Mario, Mario uh, Jacobs. Uh, he was the colonel's 2IB at St. Michel, and he ended up also as a lieutenant colonel at. Um, I think it is the Bravo group of 3 2 Battalion. Uh, you know that, as I mentioned earlier, that the battalion had two, uh, two battalions. You'll make a nice, and he was the, he also uh, took over the, the Reiki group responsibilities. Um, he's an old man, old. Um, uh, Savannah uh, veteran and he was one of the first guys uh, a founding member of Five Reiki. Okay, no, I'm glad to hear that. I, um, if Glenn Jakes is listening, uh, Jakes, I apologize for what you missed. Uh, I've seen a of Jakes and his wife in the cruiser with Tanu the leopard on, on the on the top of the canopy. Yeah, we would love to see that, you know. We all know about the lion at Fort Opis, but I never heard that you guys had other lions and big cats and all sorts of things there. Which which brings me to the second last question is is a unimark a difficult thing to drive? Because some of the national servicemen said to me it's not a vehicle you can just get in and drive. You need to understand it. Got more than one gear dealer or something. No, of course, I didn't find that. Um, although I can tell you a buffle, that is uh, very complicated and difficult to drive. And that you're sitting in that hot cabin there in the front, even in the, in the back, if you are... Uh, if you are being through that, that thing... It just shudders you all over the place. Um, but a Unimark is really, it's uh, the, what I've seen, even with, uh, if, if it hasn't got a power steering, it's not that difficult. It's, it's not like a Bedford, not even near Bedford. But they, they are very, um, 
specialized. So there's actually two incidents. I put them here, but uh, when we're doing the anti-poaching of the Bushmen from Doppies, one Friday I had to take them. Uh, the Bushmen team, they worked in five team, five-man teams. So I went on the cut line. You see here, that's the Ho Chi Minh Road, where you need to have the training camp supplies. <clears throat> so I had to drop them there. Now I'm about here. I was just two kilometers away. My unimog got stuck. And I didn't know what's going on. And it had this uh, hydraulic diff locks and four wheel and and I was pushing it and you can hear psh, goes in. But I just get stuck more and more. Now my bushman had left me. I'm there alone. I I didn't have anything. I think I had a pistol with me. So I went down, there's a like a tank, like a compression tank. And the the brass pipe broke off. So there where it needs that compression to, to kick it into a death lock, that thing broke. So it's no use. So I, I started walking. And the guys here at Hippo Base, they were waiting for me because it's Friday and then uh, we normally have a few drinks and that. And I, it was 12, 15 kilometers. I had to walk from there. And I walked. And the next moment I hear, mm, mm, and I look and there's these two full-grown lions, males, and they they just walked about 20, 20 meters behind me. I said, today, today I'm not stopping anywhere. <laughs> I just kept on walking. Up. But yeah, by night time, and I I grabbed one of my sergeant's unimogs and I came straight to my base. I was tired. I, I didn't want to have a drink anything. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you a trick question here. Uh, it's a little bit of a trick question because I don't think you work that much with national servicemen, but what is the best vehicle for a roughy ride? What can cause the most mayhem there in the back of the poor youngsters sitting there, you know, wondering what, what on earth is going to happen next? <laughs> well, apart from the bed fit and those days, but I think that the Psalm of 20, man, that thing is, it's got these uh, blades, um, blood fear, the, the suspension, these leaf suspension, where the other ones with the coil is much softer. And that thing, you jump like this and like this, you know, it's, you get it all from everywhere. Okay, then the very last question, and it's a serious one. You will recall that there was that incident at the SAF uh, pop, at the SAF pop at the uh, Air Force Bar, where you uh, defended yourself against this other major, let's put it like that. Who won that fight? Army or SAF? <laughs> No, we, what happened that the guys who instigated, remember, we, we went, as we went inside the door, they were back checking us. Now, oh, what, you know, we had civilian clothes on, but they knew we were not from the, from the Air Force. So, and we were going straight through to the other door, to the, the entertainment area. So the guys who started on Johnny from the back, the door side, when we identified them, and it's the major just when I hit him, I said, sorry, and then I went to help Johnny again. 
So we have identified those guys, and they fled in in a, a Land Rover. So we chased them right up to Mapacha, and there we we got we got uh, hold of them nicely and sorted that. But there was a lot of damage. Well, internet is this great note. I have to tell you, we're going to stop now. There's another episode coming where we're going to speak about, I suppose, stress, about uh, post-traumatic stress order, things like that. Am I right, Steph? Is, is that what we want to speak to next time? Yes, yes. And that's a very, very, very important topic, guys, because, you know, every one of us here sitting as veterans, we do have, like Rebecca told me the other night, I have totally a different view of life. In fact, uh, I'm not allowed to tell her anything after nine o'clock at night about people losing their fingers. Others got themselves, uh, whatever happened, you know, on the violent side. <laughs> We're not allowed to talk about that before we go to bed. Uh, but for us, it is very normal. It's very, very normal. You know, we came back. I, I remember coming back from the borders. And I would be so astonished of all these vehicles around me. They would confuse me. And uh, then you have like electric switch, man. You press a button and the lights come on. And then I'm scared for the lights because now everybody can see me. So I switch the light off, which, which is not necessary. And, and then I would go to a shower. Man, I'm going to get this. I've been dreaming of a shower or a phone bath. I'm going to lie there. I wasn't married or anything, you know, so it wasn't like the old police trick, you know, the police trick was you arrive at home, you throw about 20 rand of saints in the front of a yard and then you run to the back and the children is in the front looking for money and you and the missus are busy on the other side. It wasn't like that at all, but I couldn't use that much water. It was so to me all the time like, when is you can't use this much water, you, you can't do this. Other people, you know, you have these things built into you and it takes the time to get out of it. And, and at one stage, I thought to myself, I don't even want to be back in civilization. I was happy being on the borders. I, I had my things sorted out. I didn't want to come back because in 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 in, 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 in South Africa, in the States, or in the normal police work where, where I was, man, you had problems in life. There, I had no problems. I had really no problems. It, it was just fantastic for me. And and I see that the colonel is nodding you on the other side. So we got to make an episode about that. Uh, thank you for all of you listening here. Thank you for your patience with us as well with me in the gym. Uh, I hope that everything came out sound-wise, things like that. And until we meet again, God bless. Thank you. God bless.